This is a video about the first required practical in AQA GCSE Chemistry. I've already done one video showing the steps in the practical, but this is more focused on how to tackle the exam questions. At the end there are two worked examples and there's a worksheet in the description with some more if you'd like some practice of doing these yourself. By the end of this video you should be confident identifying the reactants that are used to make a particular soluble salt, describing the method to make that soluble salt and also justifying four of the steps that are in that method. The first required practical in AQA GCSE Chemistry requires us to make a pure dry sample of a soluble salt by using an insoluble base and an acid. But what is a salt and what is a base? Salts are compounds that are made when either a metal or a base reacts with an acid. They're ionic compounds and their name has two parts, like a first name and a surname. The first name comes from the name of the metal that was in the base. So if you make a salt out of copper oxide, then the first name of the salt will be copper. The surname comes from the acid. When hydrochloric acid reacts with a metal or a base, it makes metal chlorides, like tin chloride. When sulfuric acid reacts, it makes sulfates, like this blue copper sulfate here. And when nitric acid reacts, it makes nitrates, like zinc nitrate. So your first step in any exam question about required practical one may be to identify which acid you would need to use to make a particular salt. You only need to know about these three listed here. Here are some examples of salts, and you need to identify which acid you should use to make them. Remember, this is a multiple choice question. You only have three options, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, or sulfuric acid. Pause the video and quickly write down which acid you should use for each question. To make sodium chloride, we look at the second part of the name, the chloride, and that tells us that we need hydrochloric acid. Calcium nitrate is made using nitric acid. Magnesium sulfate is made using sulfuric acid. For zinc chloride, we need hydrochloric acid, and for iron nitrate, we need nitric acid. To that acid, we need to add a base, and a base is anything that can neutralise an acid, so something that can move the pH nearer to 7. When you were first learning about acids, you might have learnt that the opposite of an acid was an alkali. Alkalis are one type of base, they, they can neutralise acids, but alkalis are soluble bases. And for this practical, we need an insoluble base, something that won't dissolve. So there are two types of insoluble base that you should know about, metal oxides and metal carbonates. So when a question asks you to identify a base, an insoluble base, that can um, react with an acid to make a particular salt, then it's going to be either a metal oxide or a metal carbonate. And they will either specify that in the question, or they'll just give you free choice and either one would be a right answer. So here are another five examples of salts, and you need to identify one base that you could use to make each of these salts. So pause the video and write down some answers. So for magnesium chloride, we have two possible options for an insoluble base that we could use. Either magnesium oxide or magnesium carbonate, and either one of those would work. If the question didn't specify use an oxide or use a carbonate, then you could write down either one of those chemicals. Then to make potassium nitrate, we would add potassium oxide or potassium carbonate. For iron sulfate, I'd need iron oxide or iron carbonate. For copper chloride, I'd need copper oxide or copper carbonate. And for lead nitrate, I'd need lead oxide or lead carbonate. So as long as you can remember that an insoluble base is either an oxide or a carbonate, then the rest is quite straightforward. Now let's look at the steps that you would need to include if you were going to write a method for how to make a pure dry sample of a soluble salt. In most exam questions, they're going to name a specific salt. So you'll get credit at the start of the question for identifying which reactants to use. Let's say I was going to make some copper sulfate. The fact that it's a sulfate tells me that I need sulfuric acid. So the first step in my method would be to measure out some sulfuric acid. I don't actually need to specify a volume here because I'm not doing an investigation. So it doesn't need to be a fair test with control variables. I'm just trying to make the copper sulfate. Now, if I did this reaction at room temperature, it would be quite slow. Just so to speed things up, I'm going to heat up my acid. And I would usually do this using a Bunsen burner with my acid on a tripod. Once it's at a suitable temperature, I would turn off the Bunsen burner 
and I would add an excess of a suitable base. In this instance, my base is either going to be copper oxide or copper carbonate. When I say I add an excess, what I mean is I'm going to add too much. The reason for this is to make sure that all of the acid reacts. In every chemical reaction, one of the reactants is going to be in excess, which means there's too much of it. And I want it to be whichever reactant is easy to get rid of. Now to get rid of too much acid would be really challenging, but to get rid of too much base, I can just filter it out afterwards. So here I've added my excess copper carbonate and you can see that it's in excess because actually there's still some left on the bottom of the beaker. I've added too much and the last bit can't react. In this reaction, you do see a colour change and we make this blue copper sulphate solution. So now I want to remove the excess base, that copper carbonate that I added, from the solution. I do this by filtering it using a funnel and filter paper. Now I have my pure copper sulphate solution, I want to turn it into crystals. So I need to remove the water. And I would usually do this by putting it in a hot water bath. When you did this reaction in class, you may have just left the evaporating basin on the windowsill. And while this does work quite effectively, we don't get marks for it in the GCSE exam. So you need to talk about using a hot water bath or a heating mantle or even a Bunsen burner. Now, when we do this, it's really important that we only remove most of the water. Here are two sets of crystals that my year 10s made. In the example on the left, they've heated it until most of the water is gone and then left them to crystallise gently. And that's why we've got nice big crystals. In the example on the right, they heated their solution a bit too much and removed a bit too much of the water. And so you can see that most of this has turned into a white powder rather than nice blue crystals. This is why it's really important that you only remove most of the water. Now let's look at two examples of how I would answer an extended response question about this practical. Remember, it's absolutely fine and in fact encouraged for you to be using bullet points or a numbered list because it makes life easier for your examiner. You also need to remember that you don't get one mark for every true thing you say. You need to make sure that you've covered all of your bases and that your method actually makes sense and would actually allow someone to complete the practical. So here I'm asked to describe how to make a pure dry sample of copper sulphate from a metal oxide and an acid. My first step, as we saw in the previous slide, would be to measure out some sulfuric acid. I've specified a volume here, but there isn't really a set one because this isn't an investigation. Now I'm going to gently heat the acid and I want my examiner to know that I understand why this is important. So I then add in to speed up the rate of reaction. Once my acid is nice and warm, then I'm going to add an excess of copper oxide. It's important that I say that I'm adding an excess so that they know that I'm going to add too much of this base. In this instance, it's copper oxide because I'm making copper sulphate and the question has told me I have to use an oxide. The reason for adding the excess is to ensure that all of the acid reacts because it will be much, much harder to remove leftover acid than it is to remove leftover base. I do need to get rid of that leftover base, but so my next step is to filter the mixture and I do this to remove the excess base. So you can see that for each one of these, if I know why I'm doing it, I tell the examiner that as well. Now I'm going to gently heat the filtrate in an evaporating basin using a Bunsen burner or a water bath to remove most of the water, but not all of the water. And then finally, I'm going to leave this to fully crystallize. Here's one more example. Describe how to make a pure dry sample of iron nitrate from a metal carbonate and an acid. So again, I need to think about which reactants I'm going to use. And this time I need to use a carbonate, not an oxide. So since it's iron nitrate I'm trying to make, it'll be iron carbonate that I'll use. And because I'm trying to make a nitrate, the acid I want is nitric acid. Remember, there are only three options that you learn about in GCSE. So, I'll start out by measuring out some nitric acid and then, as I did before, I'll heat this up to speed up the rate of reaction. Once it's warm, I add an excess of the base that I've chosen to ensure that all the acid reacts. I filter the mixture to remove that excess base and then I'm able to gently heat it to remove most of the water 
and finally I leave it to crystallise. If you'd like some more practice of answering questions like this, there's a link in the description to a worksheet with more work to do. Thank you for watching and I hope you found that a useful refresher of how to answer extended response questions about Chemistry Required Practical 1. If you did find it useful, then please don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE Chemistry videos coming soon.